investments in civic buildings. Right. So now we're going to talk about how the search is conducted. Okay. One of the ways I wanted to approach this was uh, looking at it as if you were the person that's making the decision as to what software to get or utilize for the project or if you are giving advice to that person. Um, there's kind of two ways of looking at it, uh, proprietary software or standard software. You could uh, debate the exact definitions of what those are, but what we find on a regular basis is kind of to the Instead of what Joanne mentioned, is that the amount of litigation that a company, a given company, has greatly determines the amount of tools that they have for that. If you are a very large company or have a uh, in the right industry where there's a lot of litigation, um, there's a good chance you've been down this road many times and you have a little bit of process, even if it's kind of ad hoc. You still have something um, going on. One of the main things to remember when you're looking at doing the collection, again, whether you're doing it yourself, you're having a contractor do it, is, is what exactly are you trying to accomplish? At the end of the day, it needs to be defensible and done in good faith within your standard business practices. That is what you want to be able to produce um, is the best evidence. So based off good faith, your searching can be done, again, a variety of different ways. What you want to look at is um, what's going to happen next? And it all comes down to communication. So on the lines of what Doug and Joanna said, and then Alex and Kurt will be talking about, um, mostly from a strategic standpoint, you want to determine what you're going to need, what the search results are going to produce, and what you're going to do with those results. Um, do you need to throw them into an automatic legal hold situation? Um, do you need to just give reporting metrics so that you can now do uh, cost assessments for the case? I'm going to have X number of documents, X number of gigabytes of data. We're probably going to collect it this way and give it to these people at this time. Here's how we map out. So it's kind of at this one component is knowing where you are in the process, communicating it properly. Um, I always like to know during a collection the who, what, where, when, how, and why, and I never get all the answers. But I do need to know if I'm not part of that company, um, who, you know, who are the custodians, and to the extent. Uh, some of the things Sue mentioned earlier about the targeted collection, you can also do organizational or department sweeps, depending on the applications or the vendors that you bring in. Uh, sometimes it's very easy to do just you know, basic criteria. Start off with uh, date ranges, file types, and then get down into keywords or expressions and other search terms. Um, and then you can filter it out and just scan your primary custodians or who you think is going to be involved. Based off the positive hits you get back from that, you might want to run that same criteria against everybody else in that same department. Quite often what you find is one, maybe two of your primary custodians turns out to have hardly anything or nothing. However, there's a lot of communication between that person and somebody that you would not have thought of right away who would be a priority custodian. So it's really about early case assessment and making sure that you know what's going to happen next in the phases. So. Um, Pretty much all I prepared. I want to hold of the drinks. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the tough parts of that, though, in, in truth, we've heard about the 600 plus vendors and the e discovery side and the lack of communication. The, the, the bottom line is there is no one tool that's best for everything all the time out there. Um, I don't envy uh, people on the buying side of my speaking as a vendor because you do have 600 messages that more or less all say the same thing. Everybody saves you 80%, makes your life better and does it half the time. So I figure, just off the math, if you use three different vendors in a row, you're basically paying nothing on the next one, right? <laughs> That's uh, kind of one way to look at it, but um, having the relationships, having the go-to uh, vendors, the short list of people that you have quality or qualified in the past is, is extremely important. Um, and, and not always to utilize them, but to, but to use them as a resource. Uh, I, I would call in on a regular basis and not just to provide a quote or say this is what I would do, um, Unfortunately, sometimes the answer is, no, you don't need me. No, metadata is really not important. Custodial self-collection probably is okay. You need to cover yourself, make sure you're documenting everything properly, make sure what you do is defensible. Um, you always want to be in the mind of what the search results are going to come back, and that is going to be the instructions for the collection, most likely. The collection, whoever does that, needs to be prepared to defend themselves as an expert testimony perhaps even two to three years later. So you've got to have good notes, you've got to have good documentation because if you do it once, you might remember what you did. 
you do it on a regular enough basis, it all gets kind of clouded together. And after time, obviously, it does not help much. So um, that's pretty much it for me on my part. Go over there. Any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Now we get into the second part of how to be conducted. Okay, this one. Um, file types, most frequently it's email. You can probably appreciate that email attachments. Um, where we find in our business, that's probably 80% of it right now. But as um, lawyers get more savvy to the ability of technology to index other file types, they're asking for that now to be indexed. And there technically is really not a lot of limitations on indexing any type of file. Um, our software um, actually indexes over a thousand different file types. We can also, um, by extracting those files, one of the limitations previously was that you couldn't view it unless you had native technology to view it, right? So if you were Lotus Notes, you had to have a Lotus Notes client to actually view the file. Um, there's technology today that strips that out and formats it near native without a dependency on the client. So the point is, file, all file types are becoming uh, searchable, including voice and video. Um, today, so we have technology that indexes voice. Uh, it has the ability to convert the voice to text, and the text is then searchable. Um, we also have technology available. By the way, I'm kind of promoting ours, but there's other technology that can do this. We think ours is better, but, um, but there's technology that will um, understand. Uh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, the concepts within it, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, the second bullet point, dates and date ranges, certainly that's where people search from the get-go, just to try to eliminate the mass volume of information. It's simple to go by a date range, but beyond that, any metadata that's associated with the document can be used as a filter. And you'll, you'll hear this referred to by several names. Uh, it could be called guided navigation. You might hear it referred to as uh, parametric search or parametric filtering. It's all stylish marketing stuff. Essentially what it means is that if there's a value somewhere, an index field to that data, you can use that as a filtering mechanism. Right? So it can be date, date simple, but you may want to filter by custodian, by subject, by file type. All these are different parameters that are typically captured in the file. Like email, think of email, right? From to date, what BCC, all of those you can filter by that. So that's where you would do uh, filtering. Words and um, phrases, and you know, live search. Let me touch on that. So some of the companies today um, are starting to move towards a more of a proactive approach to e-discovery versus reactive. And the way they're doing that is they're indexing their data in real time. And what they do against the data is they set up policies. So that's a compliance software. By the way, the software that does compliance and e-discovery is exactly the same. It's no different. All you're doing is you're indexing it in real time and you put those terms against your data as it's in process. And when you see it, then you can do something with it. So the, the activity that we find today that some of the more advanced companies have gone through a lot of litigation is they're putting in compliance the same technology to address it while it's in process. And that's what they mean by live search. Um, indexing clustering, what clustering does is, um, it's also referred to as nonlinear uh, indexing. And what that means is that it's some visualization tools that when you index the data, um, you know, I have a very stylish Enron demo that I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it clusters it based on the similarities in pattern and concept. So what happens today with indexing is usually you index and search and you get a laundry list of results and you go top to bottom. That's called linear processing. Nonlinear or clustered processing is where it throws it into some visualization that visually looks like a cluster, looks like actually a map that somebody just took mud or something and splattered it against the wall. But those thicker clusters mean something you can drill into them. And that gives you the ability to process and view trends in your data very quickly versus the Elliott Spitzer approach of you know, printing reams of paper and going top to bottom. You know, that's not going to work.